Yep, there's Jessica. This? Did this Jessica Hello. bring you use yellow paper? <laughs> no? <clears throat> what did you say? Oh, has my class or my group mates happened to join yet? I am looking here. Jessica is group six. Yes. So, nope, we might have to put you in a different group. Hang tight. Be working, on, right. your notes, be working on your notes the best you can. Okay. And that's really what we're going to be focused on with our groups. Now, be watching, though, because I will send you a message because the assignments we're going to work on for this project, for this lesson, um, really will be better if you have some people to work with. They're not absolutely necessary. But it will be better for you. So I'll get a hold of you, Jessica, if I am able to move you to a okay. different group. Now, let me get these people fixed here. Okay, so I'm counting absent. Zach, Drake, Thomas Winninger, and Jesse, Jesse Whitaker. That look right to you guys. None of you guys are them. Okay, we're good then. We'll try to keep this here. Okay, I think we have it. Today, our first thing is we need to look at everybody's scratch games. But before we do that, anything that you guys need to report back for the greater good? I know it's been a week since I saw you, so since we're hybrid, let me know. Everybody okay? No trouble with, with Scratch other than sometimes wishing it would do what you wanted it to do or <laughs> would listen to you better? Okay, good. Now, when you go around, when we go around and present our Scratch game, I'm going to have you share your screen. So on your Zoom, you want to connect to our Zoom session. Remember, if you don't have a shortcut, it was on our home screen in Canvas or in the syllabus. But you're going to be connected to our Zoom session. So you're just going to click on the share screen icon and share your screen to demonstrate your Scratch application. The reason I do that is because I really am lame at playing games. And so people will be yelling at me, press space, press space, and I'll just die and not make it do anything right. So it seems to work a lot better if you guys demonstrate your own game. Now we know that's not valid in the world of CIS and testing. We want other people to test it so that they die right away. But when we're demoing it, we'd like for it to work a little bit. So what I'd like for you to do as you're demoing it for us is again, say your name, introduce yourselves to us again, because we're going to have a hard time remembering people in here with our masks and just meeting once a week. So we want to emphasize our names again. Then you're going to kind of, while you're getting it loaded, tell us a little bit about your plan, what your plan was. I was going to create a, a, a scrolling side shooter that, that does this and that I was going to have a bunch of levels and I was going to do all these things. And then you're going to tell us your results. Say, in the end, I decided that the side scroller didn't really work. I couldn't do very much with that with Scratch, so I decided to just make it this kind of action game. And just tell us how your plan was modified as you were working on your game, because that happens to us all the time, right? It's a normal thing. Then tell us, did it come out well? I mean, are you okay with the way it came out? Or do you think that you could have done something different? Remember, when we're working with computer programs and computer projects, it's kind of like being an artist because when you get done, you want to look back on it and say, oh, if I had a chance to do this again, I would do this one thing different. You're not going to beat yourself up about it because it works. You got it done. It's grand. It's glorious. But if you had a chance to do it again, there might be one or two things that you would maybe approach a little bit differently. And we just like to keep those in the back 
of our mind. So let's see where we are going to start. Let me share my screen first, and I'll try to jump back and forth here. So I'm going to go to the discussion board, and if you guys would all just go to it, if you bring up the discussion and you scroll down, you can try everybody's game as they're demoing it for us. So I'd like you to do that. And then if we have a bad link or something, we can let our developer know that there's a problem with it. If you have one like this, this very first one, that's not set up as a hyperlink, you can select it and then you can right click and choose go to. So you can kind of make it into a hyperlink pretty easily. So let's see. Did we have Cody here today? I'm going to switch back over to this. We do, Cody, will you go first? I know we're oh, picking okay. on you. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share okay. and we're going to have you share your screen. Chicken chaser. So wait, wait, stop now. Huh? What's your name? I am Cody Nutt. <laughs> what was your plan? Uh, my, my plan was to make kind of like a, a like a constant runner game or whatever, uh -huh. and have like random obstacles along the way. And as you jump and ate stuff, your chicken got bigger, and then turned into a bigger chicken, and then turned into a dinosaur, and then turned into a rocket ship. And left. however, like coming up with like the random items and. Uh, obstacles and stuff uh, was pretty difficult and so I I got the like scrolling background to kind of work uh -huh. and I was like you know I don't want to like scrap that because that took a lot of work yeah and then so I just made like a collecting bugs to get a high score and um, I was really happy with my double jump coding that took a long time but let's see it um, okay so it's you know, it. uh, now, now we're ready so, now we're ready you know, okay yeah audio on it makes a little chirp every time he jumps the um, bugs whenever they hit the end um, they wouldn't like disappear let's see if I can let the one they wouldn't disappear for like the longest time when they hit the end of the screen and then like I fell asleep and in the middle of the night I figured out how to do it <laughs> so, um, I told my wife I'd get up and fix this um, but whenever he hits 10 he kind of grows a little bit not much but that is Chicken I don't know why we're not getting the audio. We should be. It may not be on my end. Oh, I'm probably not sharing audio. Make sure you share it when you, yeah. Oh. Um, unshare and then share again and say, yes, you want to share your audio. Okay. It's not that important. We want to hear it. Um, it might be because you're muted on your computer too. That is a good point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it could be any of these places. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's not that big. It's just a little <laughs> chirp. It's not that important. But I just had him whenever you, when you hit the space bar, he makes a little mm -hmm. peep. And that was pretty. And then what's your double jump? My double jump? Um, so I did it in like a reverse falling order. So I kept the falling order or the falling speed the same. And, and as he falls, it increases in speed. So every time he like falls like so many pixels, he'll increase his speed a little bit. So you see how it kind of goes faster as he gets as he starts going. And mm -hmm. so I just kind of did that in reverse to create the double jump. And I said, oh, see, there you go. He got bigger. Oh, much bigger. Yeah. Nice. And then that is the side. So that was that double jump jump. That is the CN side. Mm -hmm. um, the double jump would be all of this area. So fall speed set to zero. Um, yeah, now I'll, like I did this like a week and a half ago, so uh, even I'm confused. <laughs> but that is it. And so with this, and then also with the scrolling background, I had to make the background into sprites. And so I had to make two of them. So there's two of the same picture kind of scrolling. And that was fun. Very good. Any other questions for him? I love it. Thank you, sir. Give him a hand. Woo! Very nice. The next person on the discussion board is James Witt. 
So we'll let him get started. A couple of things that Cody said that I love that were really important. First of all, he changed his plan and that was okay, right? Because that's where we are is, you know, trying to adapt our plan. And I love the way he said, it was like a week ago, I was messing with this, so I don't know what it does anymore. <laughs> because I'm going to spend the whole semester griping at you to put comments in your code. And that's why. So it was just a great illustration of why we need that stuff. Okay, what have you got? What was your plan? Uh, <clears throat> my name's James. And uh, mine's a little short. I obviously didn't follow directions properly. <laughs> but um, I was just watching Game of Thrones, and there was a like some dragon stuff, and I was like, man, I'll just make that dragon kind of flying away with the knight. And so. <laughs> so super not long enough. <laughs> um, but it was difficult to, like, once you picked them up, to like, make it fly away evenly. Mm -hmm. Just had to keep adjusting the X and the Y. But it took a while to get it matched up. Do you guys want to see his code? Let's see that code because I know a lot of people were um, fighting with getting two things to move at the same time. Yeah, it was frustrating, but just trying the different just uh, points, access points. Just use go to once they touch. Yeah, they stay like glide to and then like x would be generally like negative and then y would be a number and then you do the same but they're going to be different because this one's obviously higher up. Mm -hmm. And then if they wouldn't be evenly or else it didn't grab him at the right spot. So it took a little bit of time just messing around with the X and the Y axis. Okay, let's see that code. Close it and we want to see inside there. So if you click on your other sprite, you'll see it. So you can see how they get started moving. So that's some nice stuff to, to have aware of because they did move nice and smoothly together. This could be a problem. So let's give them a hand. Yay! And next, Brody. <clears throat> I'm ready. I had absolutely zero plan until I opened Scratch and then just started seeing all the screens. And then I realized it had to be 45 seconds long. So I just kept adding to it until it was long enough. And this is what came out of that. <laughs> there are noises. I can't get them. We to use those backgrounds. <laughs> it seems to have shuffles coming through, and that's it. Code looks absolutely horrible. Let's say it. Just super long every single piece. So we see, see some differences, don't we? So this code is just top down, which is fine. It's going in order. Where earlier we saw some that was a little bit more split up by functions. And we will see that kind of code when we start getting into Python, too, that we could do the same thing either way. So that's good for us to see those differences. I like it. It was entertaining, right? <laughs> so thank you, Boone. Give him a hand. Yay. And Shanta. <laughs> was 
far as like mobile games or you're just trying to jump to new things but um i kind of was having a difficulty understanding um how to use crash and um, this was my first time ever using something like that so i'm trying to get used to it but i made um a fox that would eat baby chicks <laughs> so, I don't like it. <laughs> so I used um, WASF as having the fox move around. Um, to be able to, the fox makes this noise. So my audio is not working. We're not hearing it anyways. I don't think that's you. I think we have too many places for it to get lost. So that was basically what I did so far was just making the fox run around and eating the chicks off the farm. Cute. Okay, let's see inside. See how your crazy. So uh, the one, the two chicks there in the background, they're just have this little um, moving time to move between each oh, uh -huh. sprite. And then these are the ones that are moving across the screen. Nice. And that, that's the fox. Looks really good. So, yeah. Very logical so we can tell just by looking at your blocks, that it's very logically organized. It's really good. Let's give her a hand. Yay! Mean thought. Thank you. Next we have Amanda. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Um, I so this was my first time ever using Scratch, so it was a little bit difficult for me at first, but it was really fun trying to figure out everything. My initial plan was actually making a game, but I was like, you know what, how do I make a clip? Because you know, that could also be really fun to do, and everybody else is probably making games. Um, and I guess a lot of the problems that I had with was the wait time in timing everything perfectly and placing everything. Mm -hmm. and and also hiding characters and when they're going to come about. But I like that. I, I think it came up pretty good. Let's see. And there is that one here, but. She's so sweet. I taught high school for so long, I expected that thing to just whack her in the head. I <laughs> didn't <laughs> get her all bloody. <laughs> so cute. That's that kid again. <laughs> Dancing kid. <laughs> Michael Jackson, sort of. Yay. Give me a hand. Inside. Cool. I like the um, associating code with the different images. It's giving you know the different sprites gives you an idea of what it's like to say separate our code, which we are going to be doing. So it's really good. Yay! Next we have Jessica, and she's at home. Oh, she's gonna jump in here and show up. 
Yep, I'm at home. Okay, uh, hold on. It's been a while since I've shared my screen on anything. <laughs> ah. I did this all summer with uh, my daughter. I should know how to do it. It's amazing how fast things change. It is. All right, can you see it? Yep. Okay. All right, so mine is Mr. Hoppy and Friend. Um, oh, my name is Jessica Webb. Um, and yeah, so here we go. Um, Mr. Hoppy is a grasshopper and um, he wants a new friend or he makes a new friend. And uh, well, you'll just see the story here. Okay, so mine actually has button, like you have to press buttons to get through it. You press the, that button and she says, hello, Mr. Hoppy. Come here, Mr. Hoppy. He says, there he says, hello, Sally. This took forever. <laughs> <laughs> then you push the space bar again. And she says, hmm, how would you like to go to the forest? We would love to. And then they go to the forest. And, oh, I'm supposed to hit space. And he says goodbye. And there he goes. My, the problem, the thing that I uh, had the biggest problems with was getting him to disappear at the right time and getting them to go back to their regular mark, like whenever you hit this again, they go back. I don't know if anybody else had that problem. But like, if you want to, you know, play the whole thing through and then go back to the beginning, you have to make that happen. Like you have to put that in your code. It doesn't just go back to that screen. If you know what, if, if anybody understands what I'm saying. So here is the inside of it. This is Abby's and timing it was definitely a huge thing. The space bar helped a lot. Um, if I didn't have the space bar, it probably would have taken me <laughs> a couple days to finish. It took it took a, a long, it took a full day anyways. But uh, And then this is Mr. Hoppy. Oh, can't scroll over. So this is, here is where um, this Whenever you press the, the green button, it, it starts it back over. And then once you, once you, she says hello, then you hit the space bar and you get this. I keep forgetting you can't see my hands. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> yes. And then the cloud, I also um, made that move across the sky. Um, and at the end, I made sure that it, hid at the at the edge and then the backdrop which that didn't really take much work so that's it any questions hey, neat. questions you guys no give your hand yay thank you, you know, how, how jessica's mind worked with the space bar for her that made sense to logically progress through her scene where we've seen some other people who it made sense to just do timing and that's 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 cool that's true that's why we'll come up with different ways to solve problems. So it works good. So, so nice to explore other people's ideas. Mm -hmm. Elijah here. Yay. That's that. Okay, so I'm Elijah Pfeiffer and my original plan was to do a, a game but I decided that I didn't want to do that, so I just did a little story. And pretty much it's two guys are playing tag and then they run into some trouble. So I'm playing. Yeah. No, his sound works. <laughs> yeah. 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 
Ah! Yo. <laughs> hey, too bad. Yeah, so uh, some things I ran into, I had trouble getting these two to line up, and as you can probably see, I had this guy still behind when he got to the screen. But I think it worked out decently, but uh, I'll show you the inside. There could be a lot of sizing issues with their sprite, huh? Yeah. So this is for this dude. And yeah, it took a lot to like get them to line up and get all their their talking and their dialogue lined up. And I think the horse had to release them out. Maybe it was this thing. But yeah. That's all. Also on the sound, if you when you click share screen, it has an option to share with your audio too, so I click that. Yeah, make sure to click that if you wanted to. Looks great. Give him a hand. Yay. Okay, Justin. Okay. Hi, my name is Justin. Get my screen pulled up here. My original, I didn't have an original thought going in. I knew I wanted to make a game. Um, I really wasn't sure what kind. Um, So it's going to be controlled by your uh, arrow keys, and the object of the game is to collect gems. Um, so I'm going to play the game now, I'll explain it. So there's my little sprite, Ravish, on the ground. Those are the portals right there. These are the gems you're able to pick up. You can see on the top, the gem counts are changing. If you hit these, they take your gems away. The whole point is you want to collect the gems power up your weapon at the end to fight the boss. And that's basically the game. So you got a couple of words here you gotta get through, collect the towns. And there's the boss, <laughs> and here's the weapon. And now your gems power the weapon, and the weapon takes the boss out down. So if your gems go down before the boss is out, you get a game over. So if you get the boss down, by, by the time you still have gems left, you get a level up. And we should win this one. I got enough gems. Level up. So the results I ended up with, I'm definitely happy with, but when, when I was making this, I wanted to have it so I could go back go back so originally like down to the left i had another portal there so i wanted to make it so say we got to the boss you have enough gems you'd be able to go back and go back each page i could not get that to work with the way i was broadcasting the changes through here um, this is the egg originally the, the crystals that steal your gems we're going to be portals to go back. I changed that. Um, the way I have the boards changing, I use a sprite instead of backdrops. Um, and then the costume change, I just use a broadcast code to, to switch each background. Um, and I found that was better than having, because originally you just wanted to do like, oh, different sprites for each little costume. Mm -hmm. And I guess why that's not going to be great for coding. Um, just too much. Same with the gems. I use clones for each one instead of having one gem. 
you know, multiple sprites. That's how I you originally want to lean on it that way, and I just knew that wasn't right. You didn't want to have that much in there, which it, which it, which made it just bad. Um, I was happy with it. Um, I, I felt I could have had the way I perfectly wanted it. It didn't really come out that way, but the way the way I ended up was up. Very advanced, super nice. Give him a hand. There he is. Next, we have Seth. Very cool, not very much code is there. Awesome. Love it, give him a hand. Yay. Very, very nice. How about Jason? Thanks for dinner. <laughs> As you can see, Scoop Steve did very hard. 
I guess the main thing I was trying to do is just come up with something that was easy to do. I never used that before. Uh, one of the main problems I ran into though was uh, getting somebody to change sides, I guess, or directions. Then you show you the inside. So a lot of what I used was the broadcast message. That's how a lot of uh, things just, that's how they knew to do something else, or kind of progress the story. So a lot of waiting and then broadcasting messages. I think I have like eight messages or something like that. It's all time for them to do different things, but that's it. Good, good, good. Ready, getting started at different spots. How about Andrew? For it, but basically it's like dogs and asteroids. So pretty much I uh, have a little menu. Or, oh yeah, my name. So I'm Andy A. Clarkson. Just think of Toy Story if you ever forget my name. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so you got the start button. Do you write it on all your shoes? No, no. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, anyways, basically uh, you have a little locket that in your keys you gotta dodge the asteroid after it's supposed to okay. um, but yeah, after a little bit, it takes on a little bit, and then as soon as you like hit the asteroid, if I can actually hit it, it's <laughs> 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 no. The speedy okay. asteroids today. All right. So anyways, so you can even get more asteroids moving around. So you just kind of click and I don't know, guess if you I'll just click a couple times. Mm -hmm. Get something like this. <laughs> yeah, you, uh, you can dive too quick for that. Yeah, so anyways, um, kind of simple, like I, I just first worked with the asteroid, um, it was actually really easy. So, some of the difficult thing was like, I so I had it in there to where it cloned itself after a little bit, uh, but I just somehow couldn't get the clone to actually start moving around like I wanted to, and then, but yeah, but so that that's actually why I added the, the whole like, Difficulty buttons where it actually starts running more of, uh, of the you know asteroids. Uh, start button was pretty simple. Any button was really simple. This one was pretty simple. Uh, honestly, the whole thing was, was really simple overall. Just to just to do, just with some of the stuff, like making sure it disappeared, stuff like the like the title. Yeah, that was that was it. Great, give me a hand, yay! Our next person, Zach, is not here. Zach, are you on the Zoom session? I don't see him. So we're going to skip that one. Jesse Whitaker is the same. I think. Jesse, are you on our Zoom session? See a JW, but that might be Jessica. So that's probably Jessica. Okay, so how about Nikki? Nikki Collins. So you had Wi-Fi, just not usable Wi-Fi. Yes. <laughs> Ended up going to a diner. Complete most. Oh hours. no! But so my original game that I wanted to play was kind of like a you go through the ocean. 
solution and you know go get stuff and it was going to be fun but i ended up with this little buggy click game because i thought it would be easier for me in the tiny amount that i had um So with this game, I really wanted to. Um, it's cute. Really wanted like all my bugs to kind of appear and then like disappear, count the score. And then I wanted it. I wanted it to end up like pausing the game, like as a level, and be like high score for this level, and then you know get harder and harder. But I never got to the point where I could figure out how to make it pause and go to the next level. So this is it's just. It tells you how much each little bug is worth the points, and you click on them. And then I have my daughter. She uh, helped me record all the stupid little ten point bug. She helped me record all the sounds, so that's her little voice right here. <laughs> this, I was um, so like the, the one point one. It goes and comes back pretty quickly and changes colors. That that five point one. It takes a little longer, and I can't click this one. There you go, <laughs> 10 points. <laughs> and you know, the little score count. I just thought it was fun. They change with each. And I didn't do anything with clones, so that's basically the entire of what I got with the game. I didn't do anything with clones. You look inside. So for like the beetle, Whenever it dies, it just goes into hiding, and then it's got to wait 20 seconds, and it just pops up again. And that's how it, it keeps going. And that's how I did all the little buggies. And one of the features that I wanted to add that we needed to figure out how to add was like a unicorn that ran across the screen every occasionally. You click on it for bonus points. How cute! But we got bugs, and they think we. Well, I think bugs are appropriate for camping. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, you guys. I'm pretty impressed she got that with her spotty Wi Fi, aren't you? Get the lake. That was really good. Give her a hand. Yay. That was our last one for today. We'll see if we have any um, of our people show up or that are absent that want to show theirs later. Let's see where we are. I'm going to share my screen. And canvas over here for us to look at. So we're to week three. So in week two, we were able to do our binary presentation last week and you guys used Thursday as your lab day. So that worked out great. We should have, I'm not in the right class. If that looks different than yours, there's a good reason. I started out in the right class, but it just went crazy. So last week, let me set myself as a student. Remember, we have to complete those things in Canvas for it to show us the new upcoming thing. So if I look at my week two, I see that I do still have this red circle because I didn't click the done button on the summary for week two. So I'm gonna go into that summary. I need to put more important stuff in there. I'm marking it as done. And then when I go back to my modules, I should see week three. So you might have some other things that need to be completed in week two. So remember, you're looking can we see it on the screen? Yeah, they got it fixed. It's a lot better, isn't it? So we can see the three check marks of all the ones that I completed. And if there were little circles there, that, that would be things that were holding me up, keeping me from moving forward. Prerequisite. So in week three, we're going to start looking at flow charting. And so far, we've just been talking about writing programs and software development overall, kind of at a, at a high level. And then you guys kind of jumped in and looked at Scratch and we saw some great examples. And as you get more familiar with different programming and different programming constructs, you'll see some of those again. We had some people that implemented class structures, which 
means they gave names to, to entities like their game. And then we had people that did top down logic, which is the way we're going to start out with our programming, just putting commands one right after another, like we do in our pseudocode. And then we had people that use different functions and modules that went all over the place. So we'll be developing our skills as we go to do all of those kinds of things. So people are at different places in their background. So we see that when we look at our strike teams right off the bat. So the first thing in this week, we're going to be looking at designing programs a little bit more. We are going to finally go ahead and jump into Python. So we'll get to that here in a, in a second. But I want you to know that you'll give you a chance to start coding because it feels like I'm, I'm holding everybody back, but not really. So before we can do a lot of things, sometimes it's nice to have some software. And you guys might be in CIS 101, you might have already done some of these things. But just in case you hadn't, these two links give us a way to get some free software. So the first one, let's look at this info link. And there's a video and then a link to take you to the Microsoft Azure for Learning website. Now this website can be a little bit overwhelming at first. Let me release this share and have somebody else share their screen so that we can see what it looks like for a student. I have a volunteer just jump in there and grab that screen for us. So we can look at using that Azure site as a student. Thank you. So the first link is a video, so we don't want to look at that right now, but let's go to that second one that says link, the link that says link. Now, this is a website that Microsoft has set up and we pay a subscription for it annually. So this gives you access to software. So Different people might be in different states in this too, but hopefully we'll all see somewhat the same screens. If you click sign in, if everything's set up for you, it should, now we're already signed in if you notice, so since you're on campus, it's gonna automatically do that sign in for you. If you do this at home, you're going to sign in using your OTP account. So your OTP email and password. And then just accept that agreement. Now, when you get here to this Azure Education Hub, there are lots of different options for you. Microsoft Learn has all sorts of courses, things like that. Student Credits would like to get some Microsoft things. But we're really interested in this download software. So let's click on that one. Now, once you go to download software, this is the software that you can download from the Azure site. So if you wanted to get Windows 10, you could search for Windows 10 and you could download and install Windows 10. Now, when you're doing things like that, like installing Windows, you need to know how to do that. So the site is not gonna help you know how to do that, but it's going to give you the software for free. So you might have to have um, an expert somewhere help you with that. Some things though, like Access, Microsoft Access is a database package. It doesn't come automatically with Microsoft Office, so some people like to have it. Um, in our class, the only thing that we would ever use is Visio. If you can search for it, you can search up here and it's V-I-S-I-O, we found it really fast. And so Visio Professional 2019 would let us draw flow charts. Now, you don't have to install it when you get home. We are not gonna do enough in our class homework-wise for you to worry about installing any of these packages at home. This is all just totally for you. So anything that you would like to use or experiment with or anything like that at home, you can try. Now the Windows 10 install, uh, the last time I checked it includes, it included licenses for five installations. So like, I think I have my desktop, my old desktop, my laptop, my old laptop, and 
one other computer somewhere. Mm -hmm. Would that only work for one computer student here, though, or if I do, for example, are just working here? Like no, no. For me, it is because I work here that the license actually will stay valid perpetually. It's just a matter of Microsoft deciding they changed their mind. But at this yeah. point, it is a valid license. So if I left OTC right now, I would lose my Microsoft Office license because I have that through OTC. But all of this software I would keep. So it would just be, you know, if I wanted a new version or something, I wouldn't have. So like for C Sharp 1, we'll use Visual Studio Enterprise. So some of the software is available for free online, but just not the right version. So we can get the, the better versions here. So anyways, anything that you want, you can come to this Azure site and get. Any questions about it? Let's go back then to Canvas and look at the one for Microsoft Office. Close it and then go back to our modules or back one you have perfect. Go backwards, I think. Previous couple of times. Now forward. And then go to modules. I can't tell where we are. It's after Azure. Oh. <laughs> you got it. There it is. Okay, so this shows you um, how to get started getting Microsoft installed. You can enter your school email address down here and click get started if you use this link and it will automatically tell you how to do everything. Otherwise, you can just click on Office 365 here in school. Oops, that's that one. Go ahead and type your email address and let's click get started. We can see what it does. Thank you. Let's just open a web browser. I got that as well. Let's try a different site then. I thought it was like office. So sure you already have it? Yeah. Go to portal.office.com. Let's see what that URL is. You know, Microsoft's always changing things. Will it let you type in your in the your URL? No, it was it was just like a little uh, the like it was, it was, it was yeah, it was it was just like it was like, wait a second, how do we get to that? Where do you want to go? So office.portal.com. And I noticed last week they were they're renaming office. And so that's why we're having all these problems. Because it's not going to be office anymore. It's going to be Windows 365. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, that'll be clear. I'm excited about that. I can tell you guys to install. So let's search for Microsoft Office. Just search for it and we'll find it. So I apologize, that's why all, the, why all the links are broken. Microsoft decided that they don't want to call it Office anymore. So Microsoft Office downloads or something, I don't know. See, now it's Microsoft 365. But you don't want Office. <laughs> all right, so when you get here, you're going to sign in. You're going to use your OTC account. Now, once you get here at home, if you haven't already, you can just click install office. But if you use that drop down up there, instead of just clicking the button, you can choose other install options. Let's check it out. And I think it's under view subscriptions. 
you guys feel like you're having to click on things. How about apps and devices instead? And here on the side, there it is. Now, under apps and devices, I apologize, but this link is going to let you be selective about which installations count. So if you've installed on your desktop, that's one. But you could also install it on your phone if you want to install the paid applications on your phone so that you have the full-blown mobile Word and mobile PowerPoint. Those would count as an install. If you had a laptop, again, so you can control which products are installed on which device here. And the thing I want to show you is on this screen, you can choose more of the Office products. So on that main screen, if you just click the button, it'll download and install the standard set of Office. But if you come to this screen, you can also choose Microsoft Access and the OneDrive and some of those other extra things that don't get automatically downloaded. So I guess the biggest thing we learned on that one is be aware that Office is now going to be renamed Microsoft 365. <laughs> so if you can't find it anywhere, that's fine. All right, questions about those? So free software, you can get whatever you need, but you don't have to get any of it. OK, thank you so much for driving for us. I'm going to take over here. Okay. Now in week three, besides the fact that you have availability of the free software, I want you to get out your Python programming for the absolute beginner book, that secondary book, that orange one. And in that book, in chapter one, they have a specific location for you to go to find Python, to install it on your computer, and to write the very first program. It's just a couple lines of code, so it's not as much as we've looked at in our pseudocode. And the book does a really good job at describing things and helping you get through it step by step. Now, I wanted to try us doing this on our own at home to see what kind of problems we run into. So let me know what kind of problems you run into. And if you use Discord and just send me a message, then hopefully I'll see it pretty quickly and we can get you back to moving again if you run into something that's keeping you stuck. Now, the other assignments that we have this week are for pseudocode and flowcharts. So let's get started. I'm going to grab this PowerPoint, chapter three, developing a program. And this one is the one from the textbook. If you've noticed in our chapter one, I gave you like seven different PowerPoints because there was the textbook one and the one that I'd created. In for this chapter, we'll just look at the textbook one. So nothing super fancy. That should look familiar. See if I can find my clicky thing. We talked about this that very first week that in order to develop software, we need to approach it as though we're solving a problem. And we can't solve a problem until we know what the problem is. My sticky thing seems to be missing. I'll use a different one. I think it found.
sorry, it's just really slow, like some of us today. Okay, so we saw this earlier. We can't solve a problem if we don't know what the problem is. And when we're writing our program, those are going to be our steps. Analyze the problem, design, code, and test. So you can tell, that's kind of what I was asking you about your scratch application. Did you have a plan? How did you go about that? How did it work out? Because we always run into problems. Okay, so here we have an example. We've been tasked to write a program that does six numbers to play the lottery. So it says it's really simple. We just need six random numbers to play the lottery. So first of all, you kind of have to buy some lottery tickets to know the answers to some of these questions. If you don't know a lot about it, like, oh, I don't know. But we can figure some out. We can figure it out. So first of all, if we have this program that generates six random numbers, would these numbers be okay? Seven, 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 seven. No. No. Why not? Only one seven is only. So we don't duplicate numbers right. for lottery tickets. So so each number can only come out once. That's a new rule we need to add, right? Because obviously we didn't know about that rule when we generated these numbers. What about this bunch? Negative three, zero, eight, nine, six, eighty-nine, six, eighty-nine. We've violated that first rule. Are there some other rules, maybe? What are they? No negative. No negative. No zero. No zero? What else? No three digit numbers. No three digit numbers. That's a pretty huge number. That would be pretty hard to guess. What about this one? Here we've got, we didn't violate any of those rules. So they had to be whole numbers, right? No decimal part to me. We'd never be able to guess them. So really, really good job, you guys. So they're all numbers. They all work as far as if we were told we need six random numbers. They're good. But they didn't tell us the rest of the rules, right? So we always have to be working, working to try to find out more of our logic, more of our requirements. So now we know, or we sort of figured out, we need six different positive integers because they can't have that in places within a specific range. And our range is going to be 1 to 40 because we don't want those giant three digit numbers. So perfect. So now that we know how we're going to generate a program to or generate lottery numbers, we could start designing it. We saw we could use pseudocode. We could come up with an algorithm, a step-by-step -step process, and we could use pseudocode to just kind of decide how we wanted that to work. In our pseudocode, we could any, identify any algorithms, like specific sequences of things that need to happen. Our algorithms that we design, we need to make sure that they're really well-defined and well-ordered. Remember we saw on that line, we can't get things out of order or things won't work properly. We need to make sure our pseudocode produces some sort of result and it must get done. It has to get over. Then finally, we could code the program. We have our design. We would convert that to program code. As we're coding the program, we would add some comments, right? I mentioned that today when we were looking at those scratch programs. We need to have internal documentation. Those are comments within our code that remind us what this code is doing or say. Okay, this is what it's doing. We need external documentation sometimes too. That might be file names or it might be like a user's manual or something that we give out to people. And no matter what we're doing when we write that code, we're going to have to use the syntax of the specific language we're using. So if we were writing a romance novel, we were writing it in English, we could use English. But if it was going to be a French romance novel, we would write it in French. Same with our syntax of our programming language. We have to abide by its rules. So here's some syntax. A correct English syntax might be, I have put it on the table. I'm, want, I'm wanting to find a cheese sandwich. And your friend could say, I have put it on the table. If they said something backwards, like 
I have it on the table put here since we've had the Corona thing. My, my brain does that to sentences a lot. I don't know about yours, but all the words are there, but they're not really kind of in the right order. So they're not following English syntax. They don't follow the rules for what we've said English syntax is like. But what's interesting is if we translated them word for word, the second sentence would be correct in German. So we can see syntax is relative to what we're working with. As we're going through, we're going to constantly ask questions. Did I interpret this correctly? Does my program do what it needs to do? Are my formulas or procedures correct? And you guys did a great job doing that when you were writing your scratching. And we see how easy it can be to veer from our requirements. Right? So even with our first scratch application, we came up with a plan, then we were like, eh, scratch doesn't really like for me to do that, so I think I'm going to veer from the plan. That happens all the time. We just have to make sure we're still meeting our end goal, that we're not getting so far off that it's not right anymore. Now, when we're designing an application, an important thing we can do is depth check. And depth check is where I sit at the desk and I just look at that algorithm or I ask somebody else in my study group, look at this algorithm, is it correct? Do you see any pieces missing? So that's how we're going to be checking things in our design phase. Once we start coding though, we're going to have software that's going to tell us if we have errors in our syntax. After we've got all the syntax correct, we're going to test our application for our program. And it's going to be important for us to test it with as many different types of data as possible. So if you've ever been a beta tester for a game company or something like that, you know that they do that. They try to get as many people as they can testing so they can find as many problems as possible. Because if I only have five people testing and all five people know that they have to press A and press return, they're not, they're not going to find any bugs. They're all going to be doing things exactly the same, exactly the way they were told. I need to get some variety of people in there to do my testing. People that don't know what the right answer is, so they can try to break it. Now, those are the steps in our software development cycle. We saw that from the very first chapter. But there's always some extra stuff. So some other things that we might have to do, we might need to have an outline or project management software. What steps have to be completed in our project? Well, Joe has to go get a new computer, that kind of thing. That's all important in getting our application done. And then if we're going to sell this software, we might need to have user guides and help files and all those kind of great things. Jack Henry down the road here that sells banking software, they do all these kinds of things. So if they roll out some new software, they have to have major undertakings to train all their employees so that they all know about the changes coming up. And then they have to have major projects undertaken to get all that information out to the banks that actually use the software. So we have lots of extra things that need to happen if we're selling. So no matter what, it's a process. Do I? I was going to ask a personal question. Sure. Okay, so we just keep going through this process over and over and over. We're hoping that our design process is going to find flaws. Because once we get to coding, it's going to be even harder to fix problems. So the further we go in the process, the further, the harder it's going to be to fix any problems or errors. So we do this process over and over so that we can minimize problems, right? So here's a little program. This one is not our music sale program, but it's very similar. In this program called the sale price program, we have been given specifications to help our company display information with a sale price. So we're going to have a sale 
And what they want to do is be able to say, our clothes are 20% off, and they want to be able to have a program that will take the original price and that sale amount, that 20%, and calculate the new price. So how, whatever the sale price is going to be. So whenever we were given this information, we've taken it and we've, we've massaged it a little bit. We've analyzed it. We said, hey, if we're going to develop this program that is input given and items original price and the percentage is discounted, we wanted to compute the sale price and the sales price. So we decided that the best place for us to start is analyzing what output is required. We know that our users want to see the name of the item and the sale price. Besides that, it sounds like they would like the tax and the total price, which would be the sale price plus the tax. So we're deciding from kind of like a bottom up approach. What's the end result? The end result here is that we need to see this data. So how can we work our way backwards to figure out how to get that data to our users? Well, first of all, we're going to need some of this information to be given to us so that we can figure it out. We're going to need probably the name of the item, which they left out here. We're going to need what the original price is. And then what's the sales? value. Is it 20%, 30%? What is it? And then to actually make this calculation, we're going to need some formulas. So we've got those documented here. Whenever we're working with our math here, it looks like we're going to need some additional data. So our output, we're just going to go ahead and identify those as variables. And our input, we're going to identify those as variables. And then to do all our calculations, we need one more variable, the amount saved. And so right here are all of the calculations we need to be able to do this whole program. Click. One click. OK. So here is another diagram. This is called an IPO diagram. And whenever we're trying to design applications, many, many different forms and diagrams have been used over the years to try to figure out a way to get everything documented in a way that a technical person, being us, can understand it and have it be meaningful. And a non-technical person, being our user, can be able to still understand it and say if it's right or wrong. So this is a really good one. This is an IPO chart. Because an IPO chart shows us the inputs required, the processing required, and the outputs that are required. So for our application, we started with that bottom up thing. We started with our outputs, didn't we? So we could actually list those over here. We said we needed the name of the item, the sale price, the tax and the total price. So they kind of put them out of order here, but it's still the same four things. And then on that previous screen, they said, well, if we're going to create this output, we're going to need this input data. So again, we need to know the name of the item, what the sale percent is, and what the original price is. And finally, our processing is going to be all of those calculations that they gave us. What are we going to do? We need to calculate our amount saved, our sale price, our tax, and our total price. So the IPO chart, and it's nothing official. It's not like you would ever be in a job interview and they would then say, let me see the last IPO chart you created. No, no, no. These are just things that can be helpful in getting everything down on a piece of paper to get it in front of us to develop our pseudocode. So as we're developing a program like that previous one, we took that, we take that IPO chart, we 
We're going to create some pseudocode. We're getting all of our pieces all put together. As we analyze the functionality of our program, we're going to try to make the program modular. You saw that with Scratch, right? So if we had a, a sprite and all the code that was associated with that sprite was modular code, right? Because it only affected this sprite, that sprite module. It didn't affect any of our other modules. So that's what they mean by modular programming. And when we're coding, we would like to keep specific functionality separated like that. Like all the code for this sprite, all the code for that sprite. So in our program where we're trying to calculate the sale price, our modules might be a little different. We might have an input module where we ask the user what's the item name, what's its original price, how much is it on sale for. And then a processing module where we do all our calculations or a calculations module. And then finally an output module to send out our output. So we could organize it that way. No matter what we want, we do. We want to try to come up with specific modules, functional pieces. So we'll call them modules, submodules of our program. But these are going to help us become modular programmers. And that way, if we have a module that only performs a single task, it's kind of independent of the other modules. Because you can, I can see if you're working on Scratch with three or four other people, which you might not want to do. But if you were, you could say, Joe is in charge of movement for this sprite. And Karen's in charge of movement for this sprite. And Bill's in charge of movement for this sprite. And we could separate things. And as long as we were communicating well, we should in the end be able to come up with a functional game if everybody does for their sprite what it's supposed to do. So that helps us make those modules independent of each other. And we want to do that so that we can have multiple people working together on a software application. Now, lastly, we want each module to be really short so that it's easy to maintain. We saw that too with some of our code, right? If it was top down and real long, we could tell how someday that might be kind of messy. But if we saw that, those real short little modules that were associated with a different sprite, we knew right away in our head that that would be something that would be easier to take care of. So just looking at Scratch without even knowing what's happening, we could see the benefit of modules. They're easier to read. The program is easier to design code and test because we could do one module at a time. A single module could be used over and over. We saw that with the clones too, especially, right? Where people were able to clone a sprite and that code came along with it. So we could use a module in more than one place and maybe even in more than one program. So we could have a whole nother scratch game that used some of our stuff. Okay, so in our textbook, as you read through this chapter, they're going to go back to this sale price program repeatedly. We're going to go back to this sale price program probably next week, we'll see, and write it in Python. But for now, we're going to let the book write it in pseudocode for us, where it's going to read through what's going on in the book. First of all, they say that we're going to have an input data module. That input data module is going to prompt for the item name, original price, and discount rate. And then it's going to input those things. Now, notice this pseudocode doesn't say write this specific prompt. It just says, in general, we're going to prompt for these three items. We would have to say, write, please enter the original price for all the specific pseudocode. Now, next it has a calculations module. It has all the calculations, and finally the output module that writes everything out. Just helps us to organize things a little bit. Now here, this one is blown out a little bit. Now we actually see the full write statements for the prompt and the input. 
the right statement for the prompt for our discount and original price. And then in our output module, we've added in some nice descriptions to our field. So we won't just be outputting item name without any sort of annotation to know what it is. So this is the full pseudocode. So in this chapter, they show you the sale price program from inception, deciding this was something that needed to be written. The IPO chart that shows us separating out the input processing and the output. And finally, the full pseudocode with it ready to go. Now, whenever we are working with modular programming like that, there's some things that are important for us to know. And this is kind of happening behind the scenes. If I say that I want to call a module, like the input module, my program here is running along and I've written some things out to the screen and then I say, call this other module. When that happens, the processing execution stops where we are in the module we're in and the processor says, oh, okay, I need to find your new module. The processor moves execution to that new module and it starts running. So now the CPU is running each line of code in this new module. When the new module gets done running, gets to the end, the processor will stop running it and say, oh, okay, now I'm ready to go back where I was and everything will continue on just like it was right there, okay? So when I call a module, execution branches to that module, it runs all the code in that module, and then execution returns back to where that call occurred and continues on. Does that make sense? So our pseudocode was actually missing a little bit because we didn't have calls. We said we're going to have this input module, we're going to have this calculation module, but we have to call those modules to make them actually run, to make something happen. So to make the whole thing work, we need a main module. And the main module is usually the starting point for a program. So our program, our sale price program, if we add in the main module, that's where it starts. So the processor says, oh, I'm going to start running this program. Let me find the main. It finds the main and it starts. And it says, oh, the first thing I need to do is call it input data. So the branch will occur. We'll go to our input data module, execute it, and then come back. Now the main says, okay, now you need to call your perform calculation module. Again, we'll step out of this module and into that one run it, and then come back when it's over. Finally, our output result will be the same one. So each of these can almost be considered their own little program. They're sub-programs. So now that we have our main module pseudocode, we have the entire sale price program all put together. And they show it to you much better in the book. Now we saw our output in our sale price program. They started out just saying, write out this, write out that. So this number here, that doesn't mean much. It doesn't mean anything, does it? It's just a 27. But if I write it out like this, 81 degrees Fahrenheit is 27 degrees Celsius. Now it's meaningful. So this is annotated output where we're adding words to the variables that we want to output to have it make more sense. Just some random stuff here thrown into this presentation here for our chapter. So as you read through it, be pulling everything together and as you're making your notes, really try to do that outline format. A, B, C, get these pieces of, of material in an organized format. 
So a hierarchy chart is a chart that shows us the organization of a program. So I'm always going to have a main module at the top. That's going to be my starting point. My main module then is going to call other modules. In this program, my main module calls module A, module B, and module C. This chart does not show me what order they're called in, if they're dependent on each other. I know nothing like that from this chart, nor should I. All I know from this chart is the main module calls module A, module B, and module C. What else do I know? Module B calls module B1 and B2. That's all. This chart doesn't tell me anything else, but it tells me if I'm going to make a change to module B2, what all am I going to be impacting? Well, I'm going to be definitely impacting module B, and I could theoretically be impacting everything, right? Because it's down there pretty far. So hierarchy chart. Get that one on your notes. It's a lot of test questions. This hierarchy chart is just that simple. Just what modules call what other modules. <coughs> Whenever we're coding, again, we're going to be using our specific language. And the last thing that they want us to remember in this execution of our programming development cycle is documenting code should contain comments, internal comments and external documentation for the user. Now, what kind of comments do we want in our code? Well, there's two main comments. First, I would like header comments. These are comments that appear at the beginning of a program, like this program is designed to convert Celsius to Fahrenheit or Fahrenheit to Celsius or whatever its purpose is. We might even say it was developed in the year 2020, you know, by so and so. But it provides some general information about what the program is. That's a header comment. Then step comments or inline comments are comments that are just scattered throughout your code that just tell people what is going to happen. And we'll get those comments first thing in your textbook, you'll see. Now here's a program that finds the size of a room. We don't care too much about it, other than looking up here are our header comments. It's got the programmer, the date, and then some definite information about the program. And then down here we have the step comments where we just have specific things commented. One of the companies that I worked for um, a few years ago, they're a big company, one of the, they're called a Fortune 500 company, so that means they're one of the 500 biggest companies in the country. And so they had auditors come in, and the auditors said that they couldn't have this programmer information in their programs anymore. They said that identifying information was like too much information about their previous developers or something, I don't know. So they had to spend lots and lots of time and effort to go through and take all those comments out. And then other companies, they can have somebody that makes them put them in. So we just be like, sure, we can do that for you. We'll make some extra money. Now, when we're testing, again, we're going to use test data that's bad, good, test every example that we expect to find in our program. So if we can have codes A, E, I, O, and U, we're going to have test data that tests codes A, E, I, O, and U. We're going to make sure we test every single one of them. We're not going to test just one of them and say, ah, it works good, all the others are probably golden, I'm not going to worry about it. No, we're going to test every single one. Now, when we're testing, we still might have to go back to that depth checking. Remember depth checking back in the day, was like this huge giant printout and a pencil and a big bunch of erasers trying to go through all this code. We have it a lot easier now that we can depth check. Looking at the monitor, we can check things. 
We can do fines to compare things. So it's it's more just monitored stuff. So we're making sure everything looks good. As I'm depth checking, I might take the test data and manually run the test data through my application so that I know what kind of results I'm expecting. I might find errors that way. Now, we can have different kinds of errors. The first type of error in our program code that we're gonna see is syntax errors. When you guys start working with Python, when you start writing that Python program, you're gonna see that you can get syntax errors with Python really easily. Python is a super friendly programming language and it lets certain lines of code to be indented. And if they're not properly indented, it'll give you syntax errors. So even though all of your words are right, you can still get errors just from spacing. So we can have syntax errors from typos, from not pressing tabs, from all sorts of different things. The program won't run at all with syntax errors. So it'll just turn red and fail. One thing that's been really interested, interesting to me since I've been teaching here is watching people who are successful versus people who aren't. And I'll tell you with programming, sometimes it can be a little bit of luck, you know? Because we can have a person who's really, really good and they get lucky in their first few programs they type, don't have any weird tab errors or anything like that and things just work. And so they get that good feedback and they think, yeah, I'm pretty good at this. And, and so they get that confidence and they keep going and that's fantastic. And then on the other end, we can have people who just have everything go wrong. Have you known people like that? Sometimes I'm that way. <laughs> Sometimes I'm one of those really lucky people where everything's real smooth, different stages of life. But if we have those people where everything goes wrong in the first few programs, they have all sorts of major problems, they can get discouraged and frustrated because they can be like, this thing won't run at all. I've had people say, I want to do this. I cannot believe that one typo in one word would make a difference between my program working or not working. I don't want to do this anymore because it's too picky. To me, I feel it's the opposite. I'm like, ha, 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 I won. I found that one little letter that made all the difference in the world and made it start working. So remember, it's in your attitude because we're all going to have lucky streaks where everything works and unlucky streaks where nothing works. We're all going to have them. Well, most of them. What matters is how we handle it. And if we're in an unlucky time and we say, I have fought with this enough. I have asked everybody in my grade. I've asked my teacher. Somebody's going to have to look at it because obviously they can't see it without looking at it. So I'm going to go on and do something else. And I'm going to come back to this later. That is so much better than the person who just keeps banging it's going to do something different. It's going to do something different. It's not going to do anything different until we're able to figure out what the problem is. So don't just keep frustrating yourself, beating yourself up about it. It does not mean that you suck at this. How many people have I had to say that? <laughs> no, you probably have a typo and you made that typo so you can't see it. And somebody else looking over your shoulder can see it really easy. But that doesn't, that's not a bad reflection on you. That's just human nature, that if we make the typo, it's hard for us to see. So we want to be really, really strong and not be weaklings, giving up too easy. We can beat those errors. Now, syntax errors are one thing. They can be a problem. But once we get past them, everything's working, right? We run our program. It runs. It tells us a good thing. Does it always give us the right answer? We have to test to be sure. Because we can have logic errors. That means that somewhere in our code, we did something wrong. Right? We have an if statement that is doing something for people that are under 18, but it's only working if people are over 18. You might have seen something like that in your, your thing. So we can have differences in logic that can be 
cause an error, but we might not be able to identify it very easily. We might have to use more test data to find that problem. Logic errors should also be runtime errors. A runtime error is when the logic error causes the program to cancel. So I might have a place where my program is running, running, everything is just smooth as can be, but every once in a while it just cancels. That would be a logic error that's causing a runtime error. Maybe every once in a while it's dividing by zero or doing something illogical. And I have to figure out what that problem is. So these logic errors can be a little bit harder to solve than syntax errors. That just jumped in there for me for no reason. <laughs> Okay, so whenever we're looking with structured programming, we're trying to make sure that we're using a systematic, organized approach. We're thinking about modules and we're thinking about how we want things to sequence, what things we need to repeat over and over, things that we need to do based on different decisions. We can express all of those things in pseudocode or with flowcharts. So we're going to start on flowcharts. We will start on those next time. Before we do that, or actually in the video for Thursday, I'll get that for you. So be watching. Now what you're going to be working on in the meantime are these two assignments, Programming Challenge 2 and 4. So I'm going to bring up the super, 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 supermarket one. And this is from our Prelude to Programming book. And it's going to be in chapter three at the end in the programming challenges. And I'll bring that up so you can see it. But I want you to work with your study group. Now, sometimes it says partner. Just make that be study group in your mind. I tried to find them all, but I obviously missed one right there. So I want you to work with your study group, but you're going to use your own individual files. So if you can't work with your study group, that's okay, but it would be best if you could. So what we're going to turn in is a pseudocode file and a flowchart file for this programming problem. So let's go look at the programming problem. I have two. Oh, I only have one copy of our book now. Yay, maybe it's the good one. Come on, yay, it worked. So if I look at chapter three, at the at the towards the end where it says structured programming, that's what I'm gonna click on. And then I'm gonna kind of go next because they didn't give us a good spot in the table of contents, I don't think. I'm gonna go back, something's not right. Ah, oh, there it is. I said that wrong. Okay, chapter three. Down at the very bottom, you can't do this because you don't have the online, at the very end of chapter three. So in your book, it should have colored edges. And then I'm backing up a little bit. showing you where it is and I can't find it. It's like, oh my goodness, why is it?
Sorry, I need the actual book and I don't have it. I'll go to chapter four and maybe if I just back up, there we go. Okay, that's the magic way. So I found the beginning of chapter four and backed up one page. And so you can do that in your hard copy also. Now, the things that are at the very end of chapter three are these program projects, programming challenges. And we want number two, the manager of the super supermarket would like to be able to compare the unit price for products sold there. To do this, the program should input the name and price of an item per pound and its weight in pounds and ounces. Then it should determine and display the unit price, the price per ounce of that item, and the total cost of the amount purchased. You will need these variables and you will need these formulas. So that's the first one that we're going to work on. Now, because you guys are doing things hybrid-wise, let's come up with a plan. First of all, chapter three. Chapter three review question. That's that Excel form where you type in your review question. The third thing is going to be the Python chapter one. So that's installing Python, getting your first program written, kind of getting your feet wet, okay? Getting right in there. Now, that's gonna bring us up to Thursday or so, where I'll be able to have a video posted for you guys to help you get started with flowcharts and with this pseudocode. So after that, there's a video, you're going to be doing the chapter three lab assignment. Pseudocode and flowchart. Now, when you're working with these, you're going to be doing your best to emulate the style that the textbook gives you, but you are not going to give yourself a nervous breakdown about doing that, okay? So you're going to be creating pseudocode and flowcharts. Remember, these things don't run. We cannot test them. Your Python program does run. Python is where we start getting really picky making sure everything's exactly the way it has to be. But for our pseudocode and flowcharts, they're kind of flexible. You know what I mean? We don't want, we don't want lousy work, but they don't have to be exact. Right? I mean, there's not something where I'm not going to count off if some keyword is not exactly the same as what it says in your textbook. What we're wanting here is the logic, the algorithm of how you would do this. So this video is going to have some explanations for you on how to create that pseudocode and how to create those flowcharts. For our pseudocode, we'll be using Notepad++. So if that's software that you don't have at home, that's okay. You can use Notepad. Do not use Word. Word tries to auto-correct and auto-format for you and it'll drive you crazy. So please don't do that to yourself. That will make you laugh. For our flowchart, we'll be using this little flowcharting utility that comes with the textbook because the textbook has all sorts of instructions for us on, on how to use it. And we'll just use it this chapter. So you can get it downloaded and installed. It's a little teeny piece, but it won't be something that we'll use after this chapter is over. So we're just kind of trying to get our, ourselves all organized. I'll post this on Discord. I'm going to try to do um, some sort of summary of what we did and what we had coming up so that we can keep on track. So 
just yell if you run into problems because there could be things I think I told you about that I didn't. I'm used to seeing everybody twice a week. So any questions? Can we use Adam instead of Notepad plus plus? Sure, but for pseudocode, it's not worth the trouble. Oh, okay, if, okay. If, you, if you've got it installed, you bet. Okay. <laughs> I, I do have Adam. I used it in a different class. <laughs> sure, that'd be fine. If it starts fighting with you, don't use it. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, that's fine. All right, I think. <laughs> I may have Notepad++ plus plus on, on my computer as well, but we didn't use that one yet. So. That's all right. You can use it. Adam should let you. I just don't want it to fight with you. Yeah. No, I agree. Our tools make it harder. All yeah. right. Uh, lab challenge four, that's same thing. Same thing. Right? Same thing. Uh -huh. same thing. Code, right. Racker flowchart. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. And I'll be you get on down in your right. Then I had another question about the Python assignment. Um, did you want it to work just like in the book after you have your you know, like you have it restart and then say game over? Um, it's got a little bit more stuff that he does in there, like puts in the comments and stuff. Did you want to order that? Yeah, I saw one added on um, then, um, chapter two. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to throw in a couple of those challenges. That's why. You just, there's like three challenges at the end. So try those. Because they look really good. Okay, so what are you wondering about? 